This is a video recording session to give you a follow-up on the Parkinson's disease conference uh, for the PD Master Trainer program. So I don't know if anyone of you noticed that I was taking a lot of notes, paying attention to everyone uh, who was speaking and giving presentation. And my idea was to see what improvement I can recommend to the speaker who is presenting each individual topic. So the goal of this video is to see if I can give you a feedback as a group uh, for all master educator in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. And uh, maybe some individual, although I'll try to avoid saying individual name. I know people are sensitive about being pointed out their mistakes, but believe me, the closest friend that you have, the best friend that you have is someone who points out to you your shortcomings because that's the only way you can get better. So the biggest problem with teachers right now is that they don't have any real feedback. They don't know how effective they are, what mistakes they're making. And if you don't know the feedback, how are you going to get better? How, how are you going to make things uh, better than before? So the idea for this uh, short video is to give you some certain tips, uh, feedback points that you can uh, uh, review and try to practice to make better on the next presentations and next conference. Remember, each presentation is an opportunity for you to experiment, change and get better. Uh, I remember I had a conversation with one of my fellow when he was preparing for Grand Rounds and I said, for, don't think that this Grand Round is only for people who are in the audience who are attending. The Grand Round presentation is also a learning opportunity for you as a presenter to get better. So take each presentation as an opportunity to get better. But the learning is, is improvement with targeted feedback. So learning is not just that if I gave 100 presentations, I will be automatically better. If you're consciously paying attention to what you did in your last presentation, trying new things, making changes and adapting and then trying to get better, that's when you actually would get better. So this is an opportunity for you to have a have an objective feedback. Um, and hopefully soon we will post the videos of the Parkinson's disease conference. And if you watch yourself present with my feedback, you will see what I am talking about. A lot of time we don't have insights. You know, remember in Parkinson's disease, we talk about insight that patient with Parkinson's disease don't have an insight about their dyskinesia. So they may be very dyskinetic and moving all over, but when you ask them, do you have any dyskinesia or, or are you bothered by this dyskinesia? And they say, what dyskinesia? Because brain is just very poor about insight. We have some basic senses. We can tell hot and cold. We can tell when it's um, painful or not painful, hard or soft, but we don't have a lot of good feedback on what we're doing. For example, our own sound. I was often surprised by listening to my own recording. I sometimes still am very surprised looking at my own recordings because when I hear myself speak, I say, this is not how I speak, but the recording is objective. And that's the actual uh, listening that people are getting. And when you are speaking, you are hearing yourself differently. But when you listen yourself recorded, that's when you realize what you're doing, simple mistakes that you don't realize until you get this objective feedback. So actually giving a presentation, which is recorded is, is gold. It's very valuable because now you have an opportunity to actually see yourself back objectively and see what was I doing right? What was I doing wrong? What could I have done better? So I strongly urge you and recommend you to watch your own presentation. I'm sure you saw a presentation of most of other uh, faculty during that day, uh, including um, Professor Aslan and mine. But what you missed was the most important, was your own presentation uh, to see how you were presenting, what you could have done differently. You can go slide by slide and see, okay, this is how I present this slide, but this is how I could present this slide differently next time and come up with a mental image or a mental story or a video or a visualization of how you want to present this slide next time differently. So with that in mind, uh, here are my notes. And again, 
डोंट फील बैड इफ आई एंड अप सेइंग सम वंस नेम और यू एंड अप अंडरस्टैंडिंग हु एम आई टॉकिंग अबाउट बिकॉज दिस इज अमंग फ्रेंड्स वी आर पीयर्स वी आर ऑल अमंग इक्वल्स वी आर लर्निंग फ्रॉम ईच अदर एंड यस वी नो ईच अदर वीकनेसेस बट दैट्स द पॉइंट ऑफ ग्रोइंग टुगेदर दैट्स द पॉइंट ऑफ डूइंग दीज एक्सरसाइजेज सो वन ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट आई नोटिस दैट ईच वन ऑफ अस including probably me although i haven't seen my own videos yet i don't have the recordings uh, but all of us have a nervous habit when we get nervous and anxious when we're presenting and we all get nervous and anxious even i still get nervous and anxious when i'm presenting uh, it's just naturally it will get less you will control it more easily but it will never go away but when each one of us get nervous we tend to start doing something to calm down our anxiety and nervousness and i have noticed some of those but as you watch your videos you will see those patterns more amplified so one speaker for example when when he was stressed out or or felt or when i felt that the the the, the speaker was nervous i could see that the speaker was speeding up he was trying to go through the content quickly go through the slide quickly uh, one of the problems with slides that are not busy is that it gives you a feeling as if there is not much to do or much to fill in the gap or much to fill in the room with something so that you can hide behind it so that's why people like busy slides because they can just keep reading and reading and reading and spend the time on slide but when there is not a lot of information then they're lost then they say oh i can i need to rush through this idea it may be that they are worried that i don't have enough time to is to finish the presentation and that's that, that's a real concern we all want to finish in time because one thing that everyone hates is a speaker who's taking too much time but find a way to externalize the time keeping so have someone uh be the time keeper for you so that you can take your time and not be nervous about running over time number 1 number 2 even if you run over time it is okay because you had something important and useful to say killing a message or doing a poor presentation because you save time will not help people will not say oh it's okay his presentation gets extra credit because he finished in time is not true on the flip side if someone did a great presentation and went 5 or 10 minutes over time people will not remember that he went over time but people will remember he did a great presentation so i made that mistake i did not have anyone assigned to give a heads up for 5 minutes or 10 or a uh, warning or or halfway warning i later on tried to correct it uh by assigning imjad to do it um which may have helped some but again it was not done properly because many presenters were probably not aware that imjad is the time keeper and he's keeping the time and he will give them a signal and he was giving a 5 minute signal but he was not giving a half time signal uh but you know things will get better that's one thing you can do next time you're presenting is that you can assign someone here we use these uh, color coded cards with number on it so orange for 5 green for 10 or halfway and then red for 1 minute warning and someone raises up that card towards the end of the room behind the audience so audience doesn't see that the speaker has less time left but the speaker because he's looking towards the audience then he can see the person at the end of the hallway raising up the card and saying you have 5 minute left or you have 1 minute left and can try to wrap up his or her presentation so one nervous habit was going fast uh trying to run through the content and that's that's a problem um because people will not connect with the information you're saying important message is given slow do you see what i did right there so a, sl- a slow message has become important people are waiting to hear what's being what's going to be said and there is an inherent feeling that that's important um another thing that i notice is that a lot of people use a very monotonous voice a uh, reading voice they're, as if they're reading from a book and then it's con- kind of constant what you need is inflection what you need is the the right brain part of the language right left brain is the content and the grammar but the right brain is the rhythm the prosody 
the, the sound, the richness, the emotion. So you have to animate yourself. I know some of you are not used to doing it. And some of you think that that's not their personality. They should never animate. But you could act. Remember, you're on the stage and you are an actor. And presentation is the oldest form, form of acting. Remember the old theaters, the Greek, the persona, where they will have a mask with a hollow tube in front of them. And that mask was called persona. And that's why we have the word personality or personas from those Greek theaters. And there will be an artist with a persona on his face and no facial expression because the face is hidden. And all he had to do was project his voice to the whole theater and tell the story with tonation, with intonation and, and sound tonality. So in some ways, when you stand up that, on that stage, you have to act with your voice. You don't have to act with your face. I act with my body. You know, I, I act out dyskinesias and, and gait problems and other things like that. I'm starting to get more and more comfortable with it. Not necessarily better, but definitely more comfortable. But you have to at least act with your voice. Add some stress and, and, and impression. Uh, for example, Parkinson's disease is the fourth most common or second most common neurodegenerative disorder, right? So you have to highlight the stress of the sentence, the, the, the point that you're trying to make. Another thing that I notice a lot of speakers and uh, some of these things I will repeat as I go through my notes with more examples, but um, these are in, in random order. Uh, a lot of people have these filler words when they have this specific word that will this they will say very often and frequently to kind of fill in the sentence they are trying to take a moment to think they are building their sentence but those pauses they're not comfortable with having a pause when they're not saying anything and so they fill it in with with word or they have they always open with the same thing so one example with the speaker is that the speaker is saying regarding diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, regarding epidemiology of Parkinson's disease, regarding gender distribution of Parkinson's disease. I, I, I don't think that you need to open with that kind of a heading or a lead in or a title. Uh, yes, I see it's important to orient people that we are now talking about this concept. But to be honest, that there will be just too many headings. It's like you are reading or writing an article where every paragraph has a separate heading about it. Because see, each slide is like a paragraph in an article, if you think about it. And if you're going to put a heading on each paragraph, okay, in this paragraph, we'll talk about, or on this slide, we're going to discuss, or regarding this, or now we come to, that's just not comfortable. It's over and over and over again. You Every slide you turn and you say, now we come to this point. Regarding this slide, this is about. Regarding this. Just continue your story. Pe people know it's about Parkinson's. So when you, you pick up a slide, which is talking about, let's say, male and female distribution, you don't have to say that regarding gender distribution or something like that. Just look at the slide and say, Parkinson's disease is twice as common in male as is female. And the gender difference is not clearly understood. The basics or pathophysiology of the gender distribution. I often joke and I say, at least we beat women in something, right? We have more of something than women, uh, which is Parkinson's disease. You know, it's, it's kind of a rough, crude joke. Sometimes it goes well, not every time. So you can, you can do uh, some of it. Um, so uh, um, one thing I'm going to complete on this idea of rushing through is to go slow, take your time. Most speakers were on the faster side, although one of the speaker was uh, really on the slower side. So when I go through my notes and I come to that speaker, I will say that, okay, that speaker needs to speed up and not spend too much time. Um, but for most people in general, you, you need to go slower, take a breath, take a pause, see what I did right there. It's okay if you take a one second, two second pause, if you're building the story and people are listening to you, people will wait for you to say the next thing and it's not uncomfortable. People don't are not bothered by it, but actually people like those breaks so that they can keep up with your thoughts, keep up with the idea because there are many things distracting them and taking away their attention. Take a breath. Don't be anxious. Don't rush through. Take your time on the slide. Give context. So, um, if you're talking about an idea in Parkinson's disease, try to bring in why that idea is important. Or as I said, 
give a context on if this is how much it is, then, so for example, we came up with this number, a calculated number, estimate number of, I think what, uh, uh, 0.2 million or something like that of population of Parkinson's disease um, in Pakistan and find a city that has similar amount of population and then you can say, or, or half of it, you can say this is, uh, this. if you think about it, this number means that half of the people in Lahore have Parkinson's disease. So people get an idea and a context. Um, I also want to highlight good things of what speakers were doing. So one good thing some, some speakers attempted as you review the video, you will see many examples of this where they were trying to bring in the story. That was good effort. I, I liked that. I, I liked that people listened to me the day before as I was giving some of those stories and ideas and people tried to remember and use them. That's great. Keep working at it. I loved it. That was a really good job. Um, I liked that some, some of the leads or headlines were, were clarified. So for example, that Parkinson's disease diagnosis is not easy. Uh, that kind of stress was being given and I was appreciative of it. Um, eye contact. So one of the thing I felt missing was that speakers were ignoring the audience. They were either just looking at the screen at the slides. They were either just looking at their presentation or, or down on the table or towards the chair. This is difficult, this is tough, but you need to make an eye contact with the audience. So one thing that I do is that I roam the whole hall uh, without making a direct eye contact. So it may looks like I am looking at the audience, even though I'm not making an eye contact. As you get comfortable, there may be few people in the audience in each corner of the room that are familiar to you, they're friends, or they're paying very much attention, they look enthusiastic, then you can actually make an eye contact with that one particular person, but briefly, and you should shift from areas of the room to the rest of the room, so you're not just focusing on one person, or just the screen, or just the presenter, or just Professor Arsalan, or, or something like that. So. Uh, try to make that eye contact and engage the audience. So uh, one thing I, I saw some of people do, and probably that's because they felt rushed, they felt that they have too many slides and they don't have enough time to finish, was they were uh, jumping on part of the tables or the picture. Um, there is not a lot on these slides, so a lot of it, or most of it, I believe, is useful for teaching, is relevant, so try to slow down, describe the picture, describe the table or the graph on the slide rather than rushing through. Again, as I said, have an external timekeeper to give you an idea of are you staying on time or not, or are you rushing and you can then rush if you think you don't have time. Or remember a good presentation, even if it's a little overdue, people will not remember there was overdue, it took too much time, people will remember it was a great presentation. Um, I really like that many presenters uh, went beyond what was on the slides. That was what I was really hoping for and I loved it. People were bringing in their personal knowledge and information about Parkinson's disease and that's very useful, very important. People are there to listen to you as a speaker and you become more valuable, informative, impressionable if you can talk about the topic without just reading the slide if there's nothing on the slide you can say you know that i've i've read this or in a study you can even quote studies you can say in a study this was compared with this and was similar to this idea that i'm talking about and so on and so forth um Okay, I'm trying to read my notes and it's been a couple of weeks. I'm not sure on some of those points. Uh, again, I want a point about monotony. Sometimes the stress was being made, but an equal stress was being made on everything. That makes it very monotonous. You have to have slow times, down times, 
when you have a softer voice and then you have to have energetic times when you have a really high voice with a lot of energy and, and slightly higher pitch or higher volume to it. So you have to, to ebb and flow to create, create a drama uh, around the presentation to break the monotony. There was something else I wrote down that I really liked about one of the presenters, but now I don't know what I was trying to say to myself. Another nervous habit I saw from one of the speakers and maybe it was not a nervous habit, but my my movement disorder diagnosis is that I think it was a nervous habit, is that there was uh, uh, some speaker were trying, were going louder. They were either coming too close to the mic or were just speaking even louder when they were nervous to really try to drown out their inner voice saying, you're not doing a good job, you're not doing a good job, as if the audience is yelling and they're trying to overpower the audience and speak even louder than the audience and, and say that um, say what they have to say, what's important to them. So uh, another thing that I uh, noticed that I have tried hard to make the slides not very busy and not have a lot of text or information on the slide, but there are a few slides here and there that have a lot of information on it. And one problem I see, I see is that sometimes we start reading everything on the slide and that becomes a problem for two reasons. One, there may be a lot of then repetition, similar things being said again and again and again as you try to read and then explain what you're reading and it's a repetition. And the second problem is that if you're reading and then someone sitting is also reading the slide, then it's hard to listen to you read and, and to read myself. So. Um, even if there is text, my personal preference is not to just read the text, but use that information. Know that that information is like a, is going into the people's mind and then add what I want to add with that information to go in to that area. Remember one of the evidence-based principles of teaching or, uh, or learning is that the job of a teacher is to provide a structure to place things in that structure uh, by the learner. So your audience it could see that structure from the slide and now your job is to fill in those pieces as he or she is building that structure in their mind. Remember, you are the presenter. Context or explanation. Um, sometimes when you show a picture, so for example, I have this um, busy slide that I like personally uh, where I show various mechanism of actions of medicines just for an example it could be any other example but uh, so if you sh if you show that of the various mechanism of action the first thing you need to do is to say okay this is a dopaminergic neuron this is a nerve ending and this is where dopamine is released this line here is a blood brain barrier and all everything on this side is in the blood that has to cross through the blood brain barrier. Now, normally dopamine is produced like this in the nerve ending, stored in a vesicle, then released into the synapse like this. And then say, okay, now how do the drugs work? Now drugs can increase the production of dopamine by providing levodopa, get converted dopamine and then release here. They can block the destruction of that dopamine. So then you start pointing out the various mechanism of action on that picture. But it could be any other thing. It could be any other graph, you can say on y-axis, this is what's there. On x-axis, this is what's there. It could be any other picture. You can say, okay, this is a picture of midbrain. So if you have the loss of iron picture in the midbrain slices, you can say, okay, this is a gross anatomy. This is a autopsy, dissection of brain. This is a slice through the midbrain. There are two different brain sliced. One over here and one there. One of them, you can see this dark black line. This black color is because of iron pigment. So see, you first orient what is it that someone is looking at. You have looked at it so many times that you're very comfortable. You know exactly what you're looking at. But there may be a lot of people in your audience when you show up a picture, they have no idea what they're looking at. Okay, what is it? Yes, you know, this is dope and dope. And you may be able to explain what's going on in the picture without orienting them, but it will stick in their brain better if you first orient them on the screen, okay, this is what it's going on. That this is a dopamine neuron, this is a Lewy body, this is a circle around it, it's pink, it is a dopamine neuron because it has these pigment, which are iron-containing, melanin pigment, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, I talked about fillers. Try to avoid repetition or giving headings or lead in, which are the same on every slide regarding this, in context of, coming to this, talking about this, now we're talking about this, so those kind of things. Eye contact, don't keep looking at the screen. Don't keep looking at the chairs, session chairs. Look at the audience. Don't keep looking at the same table of the audience. Look at every table. You can scan the room. You can look at one table for one slide, another table for next slide. You can create a mechanism or, or practice out of it. I felt that most of us that day presenting were very nervous. And that, that's okay. You know, it, it, being nervous in a presentation is okay. Um, as I said, I still get nervous when I'm presenting, and especially the, when the stakes are high. So maybe in the Parkinson's conference, I was not that nervous because um, I have already convinced myself that I know more from than these people. Uh, but if I am presenting at another audience, such as Grand Round, uh, or to my uh, department chairs uh, in my hosp uh, hospital, or or something like that, I will be nervous. So that's that's true. But learn to control that nervousness. Find ways by slow breathing, deep breathing, slowing down. Other mechanism that you can do. Uh, it's good to have a, a cup of water with you or a bottle of water with you. Again, that's my mistake. We should have had some put on the dice for everyone, and then. Uh, um, you know, from the beginning, but you could do it for yourself if nobody else has done it. Grab a water, take it with you, and take a sip of water to break your anxiety or nervousness. Um, but I think the you shouldn't forget that you are the expert on that content. And majority of the audience, yes, there will be exceptions, one or two people, but but majority of the audience does not know even half of what you know about this topic. You can tell them anything and they will believe it. So so with that, you should have the confidence that why are you nervous? Because you know it and you can say whatever you want, even if it's wrong, they, they would believe it. They don't know any better. Yes, there are a few people who are real experts and they may know a lot, but usually those people are extremely nice. Even if they disagree with what you have said, they will likely not say anything about it. Now, there is a chance that there is someone in the audience who is really rude, and if he see you're saying something that he disagrees with or, or thinks is wrong or knows it's wrong, then he will break you right there and interrupt you and make you look bad that you made this mistake. Now, the final level of comfort is to be okay even with being wrong. When someone breaks you and say, no, I disagree. I, this is like this. You have said it wrong. You say, okay, I, you know, I'm sorry. I probably forgot it. Or thanks for correcting me. I appreciate your input. That's very helpful. Uh, that way you help me not teach something wrong to the rest of the team. And, I, I, and I'm okay with that. That's the highest level of confidence. And hopefully you will all get there. But, but remember, most of the time it's not going to happen. So try to calm down. Get rid of your nervousness, anxiety. And uh, it's okay. Think of it as talking to a group of people. Some of it will only get better as you do more and more of it. So yes, that's one thing that will get better with practice. But again, if you remember to practice to calm down, if otherwise you will learn to be nervous all this time. So it will become habituation. It will anchor to the stage every time you're on the stage and the lights are on you and you're presenting. Even if it's only 10 people, you will start becoming nervous because that has become a habit. That has become a, a, a manner uh, or, 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 or anchored to that event. So you need to break that anchor. You need to be conscious every time that, okay, okay I'm not going to be nervous um, and try to, to remember the things you can do to break your nervousness and things you make, mistakes you make when you're nervous. So another thing that, that you can do is sometimes also to break the nervousness, I talked about four sources of tension in the room uh, when you're presenting. If you remember in one of our training camp, I, I'm trying to get those videos and I will post that session that we did uh, online. So you have that session of me talking about the slides and presentations again to watch. But one of the thing I said was one source of tension is the audience themselves. Um, so you can do something. So for example, uh, one thing you can do uh, is can everybody hear me okay? 
uh, especially towards the end, people say, I'm not hearing you, not loud enough. You can say, okay, raise your hands in the back if you can hear me, okay. Uh, I did that. You can see that in the vid conference video. Another thing you can do is, that, okay, how many of you uh, treat patients with Parkinson's disease? And you can see how many raise their hands. You, you can then ask, okay, how many of you know or read have read about Parkinson's disease? And then you can see some other people raise their hands. Okay, some of who among you have never heard of Parkinson's disease and they can raise their hand. So you kind of get a sense of what mix of audience you have. The audience get a sense of, okay, who are my peers? Who else is sitting there? If uh, someone is really good with Parkinson and you talk more basic, they will say, okay, why are they talking so basic? Even though the rest of the audience are loving it, that thank God they're talking about what makes sense to me and it's not too complicated. So that, that will help. So there was um, there was one speaker among us, and I would let you watch the conference, which I felt, but again, I was distracted. I was trying to do parallel processing, multitasking. I was seeing a patient at that time, uh, I think. For some reason, I think I was way in the back. But I felt that there was one of us, uh, and again, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to blame anxiety for it, but it may be habit. Where, where I felt they were taking too much time to begin to lead into the story it was it, there was some time taking to build up which was great but then it was overdone it was too too much time before the actual meat was showing up you know there was too much introduction it was just very prolonged you know it's it's coming over and over repetitively to why we're, what we're going to talk about or what's the importance or what's the context or